Tenders. Tenders on super yachts can cost anywhere between 50,000 and a million euros. A lot of money, and so when somebody hands you the keys to them, you wanna be ready. Which is why in this video, I'm gonna be sharing with you some of the mistakes that I've made, and also some of the mistakes that I've seen other people make with tenders, in order that you can get prepared, that you can learn from those mistakes. So, lesson number one. If you've got a depth gauge on the tender, or even better, a chart plotter, make sure that you use it. Here's the story, let me set the scene. We were <clears throat> anchored outside of Old Beer, which is in Sardinia, and uh, it was the morning, and guests were on board, but they were having a slow morning. So I was sent with the tender. Uh, I had Chief Stew on board, because I was gonna take her to the supermarket, and I was also gonna pick up a technician. So jump in the tender, it's a eight meter tender, jet drive, and uh, we head in. So it's a Boyd Channel into Olbia. We pass the ferry terminal, and then you come to this little marina, and that's where I was gonna pick up the technician. So pull in there first, no issue. Pick up the technician, at which point the tender is a little bit lower in the water. Head out of the marina, and then we need to just go around the corner under a bridge. And up on the other side of the bridge is a little jetty, and that's where the chief stew was going to step off and walk over to the supermarket. So at this point, the Boyd Channel is really not clear, but I'm looking at this bridge, and I don't know about you, but when I think of a bridge over water, if you were to think of where the deepest place would be, you'd think it would be in, under the center of the bridge, but not on this bridge. No, on this bridge, you've got to go right over onto the starboard side, and then just creep through. So I was just putting along, putting along, putting along, probably doing like, maybe only like two or three knots, and all of a sudden, <laughs> And I tell you what, that really ruined my day. So I immediately stopped the engine, and then I look at my depth gauge, and I zoom in on the chart plotter, and I have managed to hit the shallowest spot in this whole entire area. 10 meters to starboard, 10 meters to port, I would have missed it. But no, I managed to go right over the top of it. And because we were only doing like two or three knots, it just stopped the boat dead. Sat there for a moment, and as the technician and the chief stew moved around on the boat, it kind of just fell off the ledge, and we sort of drifted into a little bit of deeper water. By this point, I've got my eyes glued to the chart plotter and the depth gauge, and managed to get myself back where I need to be, and we put round very, very slowly now. Um, because I want to get the boat tied up. So we go underneath the bridge and we moor up on this little jetty. Open up the engine bay, open up the lockers, can see down into the bilges. There's no water in there, no nothing. We're all good. Chief Stu gets off, she heads off to the supermarket. And at this point, it would be very easy to just think, oh, it's cool. There's no water coming in and we're fine, nothing to worry about. Let's just, uh, let's just head back and not say anything. Don't do that. Honesty is the best policy, do not do that. Called up the yacht, spoke to the chief mate. I said, look, this is what's happened. I felt very silly, I felt awful about it. But it happened, it was a mistake. I know now not to make that mistake again. Um, and uh, they just said, you know, if you're happy, if it drives, if everything's good, just come back to the yacht with the technician. We'll lift it up out of the water. We'll have a look at the damage. So head back out, this time making sure I'm staying in the correct channel. Back out to the yacht, get the technician on board, take it round to the bow, lift it up, drop it down on its chocks. And it's like just sort of damaged a bit of the um a bit of the gel coat 
sort of starting kind of at the bow, just um, working a while, along to like about midships, right on the bottom of the hull, GRP. Um, but it has taken away some of the gel. And if you guys know anything about gel coats, uh, you don't want to have an exposed fiberglass because if the seawater is able to sit against the fiberglass, you get this process of osmosis where the water is able to penetrate in, it's not able to come out, it starts to react with the resin in there um, and that can spread throughout the whole hull and cause all sorts of problems. So we could use it for the rest of the day, but it was going to need to be fixed within the next day or two. And on that yacht, which is great, you know, there was no shouting, there was no, you know, shouldn't do that. It was just a policy of if you break it, you fix it, which was good. It left the responsibility with us and it also taught us to, to do repair jobs. Anyway, there wasn't enough time to fix the damage that night. And the following morning, the second officer was asked to go in and do the same thing. Take the chief stew again to the supermarket. <laughs> I can't believe this. <laughs> Hour or so later, he comes back and chief mate's not looking very happy. And I was like, what's happened? <laughs> the chief officer says, he's hit the exact same place that you hit. Again, doing no speed at all. And zoom in on the chart plotter and the chart plotter has the track of the history of where the boat's been. And you can see where I went over. It's just this red track, this red line. And if you zoom in, you can see exactly where it's, it's just run over exactly the same point. Like, madness. I don't know how he managed, I don't know how I managed to do that. I really don't ha know how he managed to do that. Especially knowing that I'd done that the day before. I felt a bit better then. And so that night there was time to fix it. And so me and the second officer found ourselves up on the bow at 10 o'clock at night, underneath the, uh, the tender, grinding out the, the damage. Hadn't cracked it or anything, but we just need, needed to get in there and, and make sure that any, any damage was, was grind right out um, and applying some more fiberglass and then we gelled it and it was fine but that's the lesson okay and i know this sounds crazy like oh of course you'd of course you'd look at your your depth gauge wouldn't you but you know when you when you're tired busy season so find out where you're going make sure you've got a proper track make sure you understand the channels um and if you're unsure slow it right down keep an eye on that depth gauge and if necessary post someone on the bow of the tender looking over and they can tell you hey we're about to come over some some shallower water okay great lesson number two fenders make sure you place the fenders correctly and if you're bringing a tender alongside a swim platform make sure that you haven't taken any shortcuts um, that you've you've prepared it properly this uh, is, a, is a story actually about a chief officer in a tender and it had like cushions sort of around the outside of, of the hull. They weren't like, it wasn't like a rib boat, they weren't inflatable. They were kind of more of a, a stylish um, addition and uh, I guess they had like some, some slight protection which was just trimmed with this nice grey material. He was coming up to the swim platform and he was just gonna pick someone up. So they left the swim ladder in, but a wave caught him and this gray bumper or cushion just caught the side of the, slim la uh, the swim ladder and just ripped right down the side of it. I did quite enjoy saying to him, if you break it, <laughs> you fix it. And, uh, but he couldn't fix it actually because it needed to go away to a, uh, and a upholsterer. Anyway, got it fixed. Another lesson learned. Speaking of fenders, 
Um, a lot of yacht tenders are ribs, rigid inflatable boats. And so they have that nice inflatable sponson around the outside of them. That is not to be used to just bounce off things. It's quite forgiving, but you will still need to have fenders out if you're coming alongside a jetty, especially if it's like a, a sea wall made of stone. Maybe it's got some marine growth on there because if you don't have the fenders out, that's just going to scratch and scuff all down the side of that, um, that sponson. And if you hit it too hard, you will burst it as a deckhand friend of mine found out when, and this wasn't his fault, the throttle system actually failed and it got stuck in a head. Um, and he managed just to boop, go straight into the swim platform and it went bang, it actually burst it. So make sure you're using your fenders pro properly. And on that note about the throttle system failing, some of these tenders use like an electronic system whereby you move the lever and then an electronic signal is sent to the engine or the, the bucket on a jet or whatever propulsion system it is, which tells it to do whatever you've asked it to do. But of course that can fail quite easily. Um, I've had two tenders like that. They've been electronic systems and they've been a nightmare. And on one of those um, tenders, in the end, we actually sent it away, ripped all that lot out, and they replaced it with a completely mechanical system. So it was, it was a jet drive. And then you had two nice big levers, one for the throttle, one for the bucket. They were just nice cables and they went from the control to the throttle on the engine or to the, uh, the bucket. And that was much better. And we never had any more issues. Last point about fenders. You've got to put them out when you're coming alongside please make sure you bring them back in before you continue on your journey. Um, if you drive around in a tender with your fenders hanging over the side, it's not a good look and it's frowned upon by the yachting community. Now you may think that's a bit silly, like who cares, whatever, but yeah, you're not sat sending out the right message. So bring them in and if necessary, because when you bring them in, maybe they sort of sit next to like, a seating area where a guest is sitting. You might actually need to untie them and stow them. And then when you get to where you're going, tie them on again and deploy them. So this is just about finding what works for you on, on your tender. Um, and this is where it can be quite interesting, you know, as a deckhand or a bosun, it's where you get into little projects and maybe you, you decide that tying it on and off is, is too slow. So you splice, the lines you like you splice in some little hooks some little shackles which sort of clip on clip off real easy something like that make them all the right length just a nice little project so that's fenders uh, let's move on to lesson three know where you're going okay so the story behind this one actually it, it starts one day and it finishes the next working on a yacht big family and they decide that they want to go for dinner one evening. So I run them ashore and it had been organized with the agent that at the drop-off point where I dropped them off, a minibus would collect them and take them where they were going. But the minibus didn't come to the place where the agent said that it would come. So I've dropped them off exactly where I had been asked to and where the agent said to, but the minibus went on the other side of this small marina. And so they stepped off the tender, they're looking around, where's the minibus? So the owner just thought, well, we'll, we'll just walk down and around and you know, maybe the minibus will be down there. And so they, they walked down, but I wasn't happy about that because I thought, you, you guys, you shouldn't be having to walk around the marina looking for a minibus, you know, we're trying to run a professional operation here. But they, they took themselves off and, um, and I went with them and we did find the minibus and, uh, and they all got on and it was fine. Um, and, and the owner didn't seem to mind and, you know, I apologized and, and he said, it's not a problem. So that was fine. But 
The next day, the second officer was asked to take them in for lunch. Again, he knew where he was going, but the owner's wife was directing him and she directed him to where she thought they were supposed to go, which was not where he was told they were supposed to go, but the owner's wife is telling you where to go. So he, w he went with what she said and it turned out that it was the wrong place. That might have been okay on its own, but because the owner still had the memory of what had happened the day before, uh, he lost it. <laughs> that did not go well for the second officer. You know, he was on the phone to the captain. Um, it was a big, a big problem. In both of those cases, you know, it was kind of out of our hands. We, we had gone where we had been told to, but it's just a clear lesson that you really want to be exactly sure that you know where you're going. Lesson four. It was a slightly bizarre one, but I've just written down here, watch the back end. Um, the quarters of tenders are um, sometimes forgotten about. And so someone drives off thinking that they're all clear. They turn the wheel, the tender pivots and the quarter slams into something. Fortunately, it's not something I've ever done, but it was a big thing on a yacht I used to work where the tenders were picked up by a crane and put on the bow. So you had to come under the flare of the bow, either on the port or starboard side, depending which tender it was, and um, get yourself in the right position, connect onto painter lines, and then the, the crane hook would be lowered connected on and then the whole thing was lifted and before I'd actually got on board they'd just gone through this period of whilst trying to get the crane connected up the driver constantly hitting the quarter against the hull of the yacht and just cracking it and not the hull of the yacht but cracking the quarter of the tender uh, again a, a GRP fiberglass and it was just like a daily or weekly thing that they were repairing this this quarter so it's just to highlight the point remember that when you turn the wheel and the tender pivots just watch what's going on behind you because if you hit the end of a dock or something real hard yeah that's really gonna ruin your day lesson five this is the last lesson i'm sure there's more lessons than five but these are just some stories that I've got for you and um, I think they're quite entertaining. So here we go. Be careful with jet drives. So I'm sure you probably know how a jet drive works, but it sucks in water and it basically blows it out the back and that is your propulsion. But in sucking in water, it can suck in other things. Um, as I found out, when I did a run from, from one bay to the next, this was in, in St. Lucia. I was picking up some provisions. And I came back, I was probably doing about, I don't know, 25 knots, something like that. And there was just this, almost like a slick of, um, of weed in the water. And it was just stretching from as far as I could see that way to as far as I could see that way. It was maybe only, sort of a couple of meters across. And it had been in the water. We'd, we'd been in that anchorage for a, for a few days. So it'd been in the water and it never given us any issues. And I just ran through this weed. And about two minutes later, the revs start to drop. It starts to sound a little unhappy. And so stop the engine. That's an important one. If things aren't right and you can, stop the engine. Uh, not necessarily switch it off, but just take off the throttle. You know, find out what's going on. Don't just drive on thinking, yeah, it'll be all right. And as I brought the throttle back, it actually just cut out. And I wasn't actually that far from the yacht. And it was a beautiful day. No sea, no weather, no issues. So I was on my own. Um, and had I been with someone else, then one of us could have jumped in the water, making sure that the engine was off this time, obviously. Um, you don't want to get sucked into the jet yourself. 
and had a look. But because I was on my own, I called up the yacht and I explained. I had the engine bay open. I couldn't see any other issues. So I was kind of leaning towards thinking this is probably the weed. So they sent out the rescue tender um, with the engineer and the engineer jumped on board and yeah, he couldn't see anything either. So we we're just like, well, let's just tow it back to the, back to the main yacht. So we got it towed back, got it up on the deck and um, yeah, lo and behold, the grate where the water is sucked in, just loads of weed hanging out of it. And um, all of that needed to be cut away and removed. And once that was done, it was fine. Jet dryers also gonna find them on jet skis. And a common thing is that guests or crew run over the uh, streaming lines out the back of yachts, um, which are usually just like plastic floating line, like polyprop line, um, and they suck them up into the jet skis. And uh, that's always an annoyance for, for that crew and certainly for engineers. So be careful with that. Just one more story on sucking up lines and what have you, I remember on one yacht, two deckies in a jet tender and I can't quite remember exactly how they managed to do it, but they managed to run over some line and I had to go and rescue them on the rescue tender. And we got the boat back on board, lifted it, got it back on board and the captain and the chief mate came down. And on that yacht, we had a, a policy of deck fines. So if you did something stupid or, or, you know, you made a mistake, you know, it was quite, they made it quite fun. If you made a mistake or you didn't do something you were supposed to do, you'd get a deck fine. I think it was about five euros. So on this particular instance, they counted how many times the line that they'd run over had wrapped itself around the impeller. And I think it had wrapped itself around maybe like nine or 10 times or something. So for every wrap, each of them got a deck fine. So what's that, five euros? wrapped around 10 times, 50 euros, 100 euros. So we did, we actually, as a, as a deck team, we did quite well out of their little mistake. For the activity that we did with the money from the deck fines at the end of that season, I think we went wine tasting in the hills above Barcelona or something. So we actually did quite well. I remember that season, I was a bit of a, a goody two shoes. I didn't get any deck fines. So in the end, I was given a deck fine for not to getting any deck fines. I guess you can't win them all. Anyway, there it is. Five lessons when it comes to driving tenders. Just something for you guys to think about, and I hope I've managed to explain it in a way that's gonna help get you prepared and help make you not make the mistakes that I have and many others have before me. Cool. Hope you've enjoyed this one. A like would be fantastic. A sub would be amazing and I very much look forward to seeing you next time.